Aloha, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. It's great to be back from three and a half weeks in Laos and mostly Vietnam, which I highly commend to everyone as travel destination par excellence. It will exceed all of your expectations unimaginably. So anyway, uh, today we're gonna dig into the tough stuff, some hard questions about what it's gonna take and whether it's even possible for movement in the areas that are the most problematic in this society to actually go forward in humane, equitable ways. And we have the great honor and joy of having with us Professor Cornelia Randall, Professor Emerita from University of Dayton School of Law and the master and author of the leading internet site on race and racism anywhere, racism.org. Access it, check it out. Articles on anything related to those topics you can possibly imagine are readily available there. The things you can learn at that site are beyond description and value. And Tim Apicella, Apicella, who is a fellow Think Tech host, a dear friend, and one of the most incisive and insightful commentators and perspectives on Hawaii and national problems that you will find anywhere. And Tim and Professor Randall say it like it is. So what do you think, folks? Is there hope for this society in the areas that are our worst problems? Professor Randall, what do you think? I think no. Uh, I, I'm a basic pessimist. Uh, uh, but problem is, is that we have systems that reinforce themselves and are capable of making changes to any incremental change. So that when you try to do something to change a system, if, if you don't blow the system up, it adapts and change and reinforces itself. Uh, and sometimes in ways way worse than the original uh, problem. So I, right now, our system of capitalism, uh, robber capitalism, whatever you want to call it, is so reinforced profit making uh, and all the systems that we have, the problems that we have leads back to that. And I don't see how you blow up capitalism. Um, I just... I just, I think that we can make life better for some people. So, so yeah, I, I can, I can do things to get more housing. I can do things to get more educated. Uh, I can do things to make life better for people. And I, as a public health nurse, I used to tell people, you advise people individually to do the best they can under the circumstances they're in. And so that may mean that uh, you would advise a, a person who poor and black uh, to eat better, to buy less fast foods, to do all that. But I also understood that was an impossibility if uh, without food stores in her uh, without affordable, fresh food in the community. And so on one hand, you want to advise people so that if by chance they are able to do something, they do it. But on the other hand, you know that as long as you don't change the system, 99% of the people you're advising are not going to be able to make a change. And so I don't see how I don't, when we talk about change, we're always talking about incremental change. And I, I just don't believe that it's possible to do anything. I think until we can find a way to blow the system up, boom, 
maybe a zombie apocalypse. Apocalypse. That's that is probably the most incredible several minute encapsulation of the heart of what's wrong with and obstructing us from moving forward toward a more equitable, humane, responsible, connected society that I have ever heard. And I'm so glad it's recorded and that we'll be able to make it available to people because we can get this stuff out there on LinkedIn and other sites and people are looking at it now and they're reading it. And I hope you'll post it on your racism.org blog as well, but you Most just definitely. said it incredibly well. People have been disconnected and the people with the greatest needs have been disconnected with access to affordable resources for essential life elements, housing, employment, education, healthcare, <clears throat> livable environments, all of those things and more. Tim, your thoughts? I, I, I am a little more optimistic. I, I am a pessimist by nature, but I am optimistic and not to say, Professor Randall, that this is a point-counterpoint show today, but I, I think there's hope. And I'll, I'll, I'll refer to a gentleman by the name of um, Robert Putnam, who originally did an essay back in 1995, um, and then he followed up five years later uh, called a book called Bowling Alone, uh, The Collapse and Revival of American Communities. And the premise of the book was since the 1950s, uh, the engagement of, of all Americans in social activities um, have been on a steady decline. And when I say social activities, I'm talking about going to church, um, bowling leagues, um, Kiwanis clubs, Rotarian clubs, any, you know, knitting clubs, you name it. Um, you know, Americans used to be heavily involved in social activities outside of the workplace. And with that, that connectivity of, of, of relationships in social um, activities, I think Americans found um, diversity from their neighbors, uh, diversity from not their immediate neighbors, maybe from other cities and townships, uh, a commonality that um, they would not normally get in the open marketplace of ideas. Um, the formation of relationships somehow can oversee the differences of religion and oversee the differences of your political positions. And what uh, Mr. Putnam was trying to say in his, his 2000 book was democracy is interdependent upon the social contract. Uh, this social compact that we have with our fellow Americans has been uh, severely strained. And, and by empirical data, he was able to show the decline of, of, of participation in social groups. Uh, what he did, he went to basically where ad agencies got their data on uh, demographics of the consumer. And it was just a treasure trove of, of data that surveyed about every question you could possibly think of about consumer behavior and social groups. What do they belong to? What did they like? Um, and so he took five years to compile this book because he took great, um, he took some hits. He took some criticism on his 1995 essay because they said, well, qualitatively, he's onto something, but quantitatively, he can't back it up. Well, five years later, he was able to back it up, and it's been recognized as a, a, a landmark uh, case study of what's wrong with America. And now let's fast forward to 2023, or actually the last five, seven years of the polarization of Americans uh, pertaining to their politics. Uh, now it's a sin to extend one's hand across the aisle to work with your Republicans or work with your Democrats. It's a sin. And in fact, in the case of the Speaker of the House, that was one of the grievous sins that if you committed, you would not be Speaker of the House. Uh, the other one, of course, was you had to be an election denier of the 2020 election. So the point is this. How are we going to prove any of our systems, which Professor Randall refers to, those systems are based on human beings. And if human beings are isolated... Uh, they're no longer interacting and communicating with one another. There's, there's no good faith uh, amongst um, fellow Americans because uh, we're suspicious now, uh, because we don't go from the same set of facts. And so how, how does anything get done or, or improve as far as systems and politics if, if we're suspicious of one another, we're, we're self-isolationists, and 
that is really the, the basis of how we improve if we don't start uh, engaging. Um, the Hawaii Film Festival had a, a documentary called Join or Die, based on Mr. Putnam's work. And it's to that we're at, at this point in time in this country. So I'm optimistic that people can re-engage. Um, we can get back into, you know, uh, systems, not systems, excuse me, uh, social groups that unite us rather than divide us. I don't disagree with you. And I don't disagree with him on that, uh, the point that he was making. I think that's like the difference, what you pointed out, what you just said is individual uh, kind of uh, helping people, uh, you know, getting people more involved, getting people to work across the aisle. I, I do the work that I do because I, basically because I wanted to be able to say to my grandsons, uh when they when they grow up to a shitty ass world and and they would say grandma you know this world is shitty what did you do i can say well hey i tried <laughs> you know i did the best i could under the circumstance i'm in i do think that there's i mean i don't i think that there's issues of being disconnected but that disconnection comes from system failure. People no longer, I mean, you. It, it's hard to get motivated to work in groups, to do stuff for others when, you know, when you have billionaires donating a million dollars and then asking you to give your hard aid one dollar uh, instead of, donating 10 billion dollars uh uh you know it it you it's discouraging as an individual to see okay i'm in my 70s <laughs> i suspect it is disturb, it's disturb disturbing for people to see my life work hasn't moved us an inch mm -hmm. and and i'm not the only one hundreds of thousands of people have was involved in my generation and we didn't move the needle an inch and so i can i can't argue for involvement for no other reason to say to our children we tried but i can't say that i think doing more of the same thing or the thing in the 50s which was Jim Crow and racism as bad as now, I can't say doing more social groups uh, is going to blow up the system. And when people do these, when people work together, they, you know, when I get in groups, people get disturbed by me saying blow up the system. They don't want to hear that. They want to have a way to change the system without blowing it up. They don't want to hear that incremental change ain't going to make a difference. Yeah. Well, really I, I can see why they're, they're upset. <laughs> 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 and if I am my I'm opine for a moment, why to hear that upsets me. <laughs> um, it's Professor Rando, it's like this. In, in a vacuum of, 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 of control or what you want to call government, in a vacuum, you have the deplorables fill the vacuum. And I'm thinking of the deplorables like Donald Trump. Uh, this is a wannabe fascist waiting to come back in and completely change this form of government. And not for the better. I don't think for the individual, pr prosperity would be 10 times worse. Uh, if you're one of the 1%, your life's going to be much better. But... Um, you know, it's that vacuum that concerns me when someone says, let's, let's dismantle the entire system and start fresh because uh, we are not agents of good free will. Um, human beings, by and large, are a bunch of nasty critters. <laughs> and if there's not some sense of moral and ethical guidance, uh, be it through religion or just self-temperance, um, the worst comes to play. And I, I'm thinking of the Dark Ages. I'm thinking of the Middle Ages. And um, it didn't go well for people back then. And we can visit those days again. Yeah, and we may need to visit them. <laughs> or, I'm not serious. I, 
am serious. I know you are. <laughs> so, I, the so maybe is, the witch hunts are a good idea. We're too comfortable. We, we're so, we're too comfortable with the way things may need to get much worse in order for things to get better. You know, it, I mean, I, I, you, 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 a fever. I mean, there's a point where a fever will kill you, but mostly a fever is a good thing. Uh, and that we should just let a fever, you know, do, let the body work. And, but we're so afraid and rightfully so. I don't discount that. I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I think the Republicans are setting up a way by electing a speaker who is pro-Trump so that it, in the 24 elections, they'll have a speaker of the house who will do what they want to do. I don't know, I can't argue against that, but mm -hmm. I do know that we're not gonna make people, as long as we are doing incremental change, uh, we, we're bounding for people to live in homelessness, we're bounding for people to be under uneducated. We're bound, where people are going to be without food. Uh, you know, racism is going to be rampant. Sexism, homophobia, Th those things exist before Trump. Trump on Trump didn't yeah. cause those. Trump unleashed what was already in people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I don't know, I, I don't disagree with you on the, 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 that what could replace the system could be worse than what we got. But I'm so upset with what we got that I'm willing to risk that. <laughs> well, you know, as the old saying goes, be careful what we wish for, we might get it, you know. And we might not. And we might not, but I, you know, what I wish for, and it, you know, I'd be careful what we wish for. We might get it. Well, what I wish for is a society. What came after the uh, uh, the the dark ages and all of that stuff was a more enlightened society because they learned from that that they wanted something different than that, and they rebelled. They overthrew. I mean, you know, uh, we pride ourselves on our country, but our country came through rebellion. The French Revolution came. I mean, ever the, these things came through rebellion. They didn't come from people doing clubs. Well, Americans are unruly bunch by nature. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, but, you know, it just seems to me that there's the, 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 the argument of dismantling a system versus, uh, I guess, the, the inflection points Americans have received throughout history. And I'm thinking of two inflection points. One was the Vietnam War, where I think Americans really did get a lesson about you know, our role in the world and, and, and basically the mistakes we made as we thought we were the defenders of democracy and what a terrible price we paid as Americans. I think that was an inflection point that Americans understood for a brief time. And then we forgot the lesson. Uh, very quickly, we forgot the lesson. And then, you know, I'm thinking yeah, very, of 9-11. Very yeah, very quickly, unfortunately. And then I'm thinking of 9-11 as an inflection point is what is our role in the world, particularly in the Middle East? And you know, how are we conducting ourselves um, ethically as a nation as we're trying to do global uh, diplomacy or the lack thereof? And so it's the inflection points that Americans get to think about. And you're right, Professor Randall, that's not changing the system a whole lot. But if we get more inflection points, um, maybe we will start to say, what, what, what primary elements in our system do we need to correct in order to be uh, a better society and, and a society that helps one and all, uh, lifts people up, not pushes push people down and, 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 and elevate the 1%. So how long do you think that'll take? Well, it's taken 250 years at this point. It's um, taken 500 years. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> and, you know, um, 
You know, I'm thinking of President Obama's uh, speech about progress and that progress is never a linear, a linear um, slight increase or a slope up. It's, um, it's fraught with, um, you know, uh, backward movement. And I definitely think we're in a backward movement. Uh, in the last 50 years, have we seen progress? Yeah. Have we seen enough of it? No, not even close. But there was progress, and there was society uh, progress. I think um, we had economic prosperity for a lot more Americans than we did back in the 1960s, 1950s, 40s. Um, these are slow-moving changes, and, and certainly not fast enough for me. And I'm going to guess, Professor Randall, not, certainly not fast enough for you. No, not at all fast enough. And, uh, you know, the idea of incremental changes and, you know, uh, change, things going up and down and not a linear slope. Yeah, that's true. But you, I, I don't, I'm not as sure that we have been a country in steady progression of improvement. I think that's the myth we tell ourselves because we have short lives. And so, you know, it's kind of short like- Short memories too. And short memories. And so during our lifetime and during our, we, we can see the small changes in the things that go up or down, but we don't really have the, the, long, the long look. And we don't see how, capitalism and racism has gone fundamentally unchanged over hundreds of years and that they've been at the root of most of the problems in this society. And, and so we, we are, and going back to my public health nurse analogy, we are doing better by helping more people in the middle. But we're, we're we're still in the we're still in the box, <laughs> we're, you know. We're we're the box expands, the box retracts, but we're still in the box of capitalism. We're still in the box of racism, and uh, I don't see that hasn't changed. You know how it's been expressed has changed. Um, but I don't know that that that's changed in any significant. And no, I I don't want to say it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. It's gotten worse. Both capitalism and racism has gotten worse, and worse over the last I'd say fifty years, like you say, or hundred years. Or did it did it ever really get better? I, well, we, I, we are really good on temporary, like uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, everybody, we cite back to, to that. And that was an important case that uh, got rid of separate but equal as a matter of law. Uh, but ch no change happened. <laughs> The changes didn't happen. I grew, that was what, in 53? I graduated from a segregated high school in 66. So, and then uh, there are studies showing that the United States is still the most segregated, more segregated than during that period. And the schools are more segregated. So, I mean, we tout these things as, as improvement, but they really weren't. And we really haven't made, I mean, we have made improvement in person, personality, personal uh, relationships. So I think the, and, and the, maybe that's a, why we can't move further, because we think if we're married to a white person, if we're married to an Asian person, if we're married to a, uh, uh, someone different, and if our children are mixed race, and our church is integrated, that, hey, look what we've done. 
Mm-hmm. While meantime, the you know, people are going hungry and unfed and, and experiencing police violence uh, at rates that are increasing and unwillingness to change the systems that those people live in. Willing to do the, in, we're, we're willing to do individual networking, working together. We're not willing to fundamentally change the systems. I just think that societies around the world um, throughout history is when you see a collapse of the middle class, you get the haves and the have nots. <clears throat> That's when you start seeing you know, violence in the street, uh, increase of crime and potentially revolutionary type actions. I, I think we had an expansive middle class uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and then it started to retract. Uh, I could I could say the Ron, Ronald Reagan administration definitely was a turning point, an inflection point on the expansion of the middle class. And I think without a middle class, uh, any society, any country is doomed for hard times ahead. And that's I think that's the crux of part of our problem is uh, economic disparity uh, and pressure on the middle class that is being forced into um, a less economic class and the rich get richer and the resentment grows stronger. And what do you say to that? Uh, It's got to stop. There has to be a a, a better fair, just taxation system that it's not a redistribution of wealth as the, uh, the Republicans like to call it. It's a, paying your fair share. And that's not happening. And that creates resentment about those taxpayers that take very little of what they have in front of them. And those prices are increasing for taxation, but also just good old fashioned inflation. And resentment equals um, basically apathy. Apathy leads to what I call um, an autocracy or a plutocracy, or if you want a fascist fascism. It, it, it's it's a, it's a breeding ground for a strong man uh, like Donald Trump to fill that void. And we've got to start looking at the core elements of our despair in this country, I think, and, and start addressing the, the building blocks of what we need to work on. I find it interesting that you, you I, I, uh, that the middle class, you date the destruction of the growing, if I heard you right, you you date the growing of the middle class with Ronald Reagan. Is no, no, no. I, no, the destruction of the middle class with Ronald oh, Reagan. Okay, because I was going to say <laughs> that, that's, yeah, Ron, yeah. we see Ronald Reagan totally yeah, different. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, so well, we're, we're basically okay. out of time for today, but just last thoughts, Professor Randall. Is there anything out there that you see that might offer some promise or possibility of movement toward that kind of age of enlightenment and renaissance where people can live humanely, responsibly, equitably, and kindly with each other? I don't see anything. Because even though I see uh, Trump and the Republicans move as fascists, I see the Democrats as a milder, more gentler, fascists they they that 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 they do a little bit of here and a little bit of there uh and there n- neither party is about fundamentally changing the system i uh, uh they support wars both parties support wars both party uh the republicans uh tax more but the democrats the, you know they they are not you know, they they do some things, but uh, no, I don't see I don't see anything out there that's moving towards what I see. And I don't to, to be honest, I don't have a clue about how to do that. I just really fundamentally bleed to my bones that as long as we work within the system, we will maintain the system. Tim, last thoughts? Wonderful, Professor Randall. Thank you. Uh, earlier on, I said I'm a you know a pessimist at heart, and unfortunately, here here it comes. Um, I think we we don't improve a whole lot moving forward. I think technology gets 
more and more into our lives, that leads to greater isolationism in, within the American population. Uh, isolation means less, not more, human communication. Less human communication equals a deterioration of relationships. And if we don't have co co you know, coalitions of, uh, within our communities, um, we don't have a good, solid, healthy democracy. And that leads to the Donald Trumps of the world. So I'm not optimistic because uh, we can't and we're not going to stop technology advances. Thank you both for Thank your you. extremely valuable thoughts and insights. And I think in wrapping up, one of the things that we're hearing and seeing is that as individuals, we still have those moral human connective responsibilities, and we're going to live them and fulfill them the very, very best we can for the generations coming, for our children, for our grandchildren, for the people who inherit whatever world we leave to them, leave, leave them. But in addition to that, we need to be extremely careful that things that we do that enable change that brings more equitable, humane, responsible connections and life between people don't simply serve and enable the perpetuation mm -hmm. of the systemic failures, deficiencies, and inequities that are oppressing far more people than is humanely acceptable. Thank you all for your time, your thought, your insight. Think Tech Hawaii, hard questions in hard times. Mm -hmm.